Welcome back to HANA Basics for Developers. So we've spent a lot of time in the previous exercises and videos going through uh, database level development. We've seen a pretty wide range of development from being able to create our own data model, tables and views, uh, to be able to create advanced views with calculation views, writing logic within the database in the form of uh, SQL script, and we dove pretty deep into SQL script showing you different language aspects and tooling, debugging, uh, and, and things like that around, um, around the database level development. So I think at this point, everybody should have a fairly good comfort level, hopefully, with database level development. Of course, there are other things that you can do. We didn't touch on every type of database artifact. Uh, or the full range of development, but uh, you should have an idea of the, the various parts and pieces and how they can be used together. What we want to do now is, uh, is move up to the application server layer a little bit and talk about, uh, and talk about it. So going back to uh, the very first video in the series, we talked about how we have an application server uh, sitting on top of the HANA database, really as part of your HANA installation. We have an older version that we now refer to as XS Classic that was an embedded JavaScript-based uh, engine. And then we have a newer version based upon Cloud Foundry that uh, has support for multiple language runtimes, JavaScript, Node.js being one of those, Java, Python, even bring your own language support being another. And we haven't really done much at this application server layer. At the very beginning, one of the first exercises and videos that we did was uh, creating a little hello world web page, the, the application router, the web module as part of our application to test our security. But we want to start playing around in this application server layer and seeing how we can take our database artifacts whether they be tables or calculation views or stored procedures and expose them to the outside, whether that be another system that's calling them, whether it be a, a dedicated uh, tooling of, you know, from another vendor or, or whether it's your own application that you've written, maybe an SAP UI5 or Fiori application. That's, that's a very common use case. So, so we'll see some of that, but how can we, how can we prepare our, our database artifacts and, and our data exposure so that it can be easily consumed from the outside. And a lot of time that means creating RESTful services. Now, it's important to note here, we have this older environment, the XS Classic. It is still there inside of HANA, but eventually we are going to remove it uh, in the next major release of HANA. It was JavaScript based, but of course we have a JavaScript runtime in the form of Node.js support in the new XS Advanced environment as well. And what we were able to do is we rewrote basically this, um, we had our own extension to the JavaScript language, XSJS. And it was pretty much pure JavaScript, but we added some of our own APIs into the environment and, and we made the execution all synchronous. So no, no venting, no asynchronous processing. Um, and it made for a pretty simplified programming model, particularly those APIs were really focused on making it easy to uh, send queries into the database and then process the results, something that you would imagine we do a lot of in the, in the HANA world. The other thing that, um, that we had in this XS Classic environment was uh, something we called XSO data, which was just a, a way to very easily and very quickly define OData services from existing tables and views. So with like one line of code in a, in a design time artifact, we could create a, a complete service that had uh, create, update, delete, and, and of course read operations built into it. It was a, a near zero coding solution for very quickly uh, exposing your existing database artifacts as, as RESTful OData services. And because it was so easy to use, that's what a lot of customers latched onto and did use in this XS Classic environment. And what we've done, you know, we have JavaScript, it, it is Node.js. We'll learn later about, you know, what are the unique capabilities and, and aspects of Node.js development. But one of the things that we've done is we've taken XSJS and XSO data and we've re-implemented them in Node.js. 
as reusable Node.js modules. Uh, so this makes it really easy if you have existing development in XS Classic to essentially pick it up and just drop it into the uh, XS Advanced environment. It also still offers you this easier programming model, a, a quick way to get started with doing uh, JavaScript-based development on the application server side. And of course, the OData services, um, it's still really uh, one of our main ways to offer OData v2 and, 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 and uh, version 2-based services. And um, probably one of the easiest ways that you can possibly create OData services out of our many different technology options that we have for uh, for creating and working with OData services. So it's still a rather attractive solution, um, even you know now that we've moved into um, this XS Advanced environment where we have full Java and, and full Node.js support. This, this still has a, a, a pretty uh, important place, and there's nothing wrong with continuing to, to use some of the older APIs that, that now execute inside the, the new environment. So that's what we want to do in this video is uh, just give you a little introduction to what it's like to create and utilize XSJS and XSO data inside uh, XS Advanced and, and the web IDE. So one of the first things we have to do, uh, we come back to our project and uh, we already have a Node.js module, right? It was created by the wizard early on. Um, you know, of course, we could have created a Node.js module manually as well. We just come here and we choose new Node.js module. But the thing is, this Node.js module, this is a quote unquote pure Node.js module. Um, you know, it's going to start up and it's going to run and allow you to write your own custom Node.js code. What we want to do is we want to utilize this uh, compatibility mode, if you will. Um, early on, some of the internal developers kind of described this as, as DOS box. I don't know if you've ever done any uh, Windows gaming uh, with classic games uh, that were originally designed to run in MS-DOS. We're going back quite a ways here, but this, this harkens back to my childhood as well. Um, there's some really great old games, but they don't run in Windows anymore. So there's a great little technology called DOS Box that basically runs the uh, the MS DOS operating system um, sandboxed off from the rest of the operating system and and runs inside of Windows and allows you to take these great old classic games and run them in a modern Windows environment. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We create a, a little sandbox and we reduce the um, the programming model and the API set back to what XS Classic had. And in doing so, we simplify the programming model, uh, but yet it still executes inside of XS Advanced. Uh, and so we're not uh, holding on to the whole XS Classic infrastructure. We're not running in a separate application server. We are taking advantage of the microservice environment and the new security model and containerization uh, and all these great new things, but without completely rewriting our application code. So it's really a, a nice solution. But what it means is we can't mix and match this with our existing Node.js module. So we're going to keep this SRV module uh, for our pure Node development, which we'll do more of later. And in the meantime, we're going to create a whole new module. So it'd be a separate microservice that we can dedicate for our backwards compatibility XSJS module. So we'll start just by creating another Node.js module. And uh, we're going to name this one XSJS, just so it's obvious to any developer who comes along and looks at our project. Oh, this is where all the, uh, all the backwards compatibility stuff, this is using XSJS APIs. I can do my XSJS and XSO data inside this module. You don't have to name it that. You can name it anything you want. But uh, we'll do that just so it's obvious. And uh, the key here is just in this wizard, we check this box. Enable XSJS support. And what that's going to cause um, the wizard to do is, is basically write different code into the server.js. So we're still going to have our entry point be a pure Node.js. Uh, that's what the server.js. But the wizard is going to write the bootstrap code for us that will uh, start up the XSJS environment. Now, for the most part, we usually don't have to go in and, and mess around with this code and, and really alter it. Um, but we can take a look at it quickly. Basically, what we're doing here is we see that XSJS itself and this little XS environment 
uh, library? Well, these are Node.js modules. We've taken the XSJS APIs and the XSO data, and we've rewritten them in Node.js. And this require statement is the Node.js syntax that allows us to access and load existing Node.js modules. And, and that's how we make them uh, available in our environment here. And then we can set some options. The only thing we want to do here is we want to go ahead. The default wizard sets up an anonymous service, which you're probably not doing very often. Uh, but it makes it easy to test, so you don't have to have security set up. But we were good in our very first video uh, when we started working the Web IDE. We went ahead and we attached security to our application, so we can go ahead and turn off this anonymous. Uh, then it loads the HANA configuration, so our our HANA HDI container configuration, just like we had attached it to our database module. We'll attach it in a moment to our XSJS module in our MTA YAML. And what this code is basically doing, it's going out and it's reading all the settings that are contained inside that module. And it's loading them into memory. Um, and it's things like the username, the password, the connection string, the port, all that. We don't hard code that anywhere. We don't set it up in any configuration files. It's all read dynamically at runtime uh, from the service binding itself. And we do the same thing with the security settings. We, we get the binding to the UAA service, and that's going to load all of our security. And then basically, we just pass the settings, whatever we got out of the bindings, we pass it into the XSJS module and tell it to start up. And like I said, really, other than the options, we don't need to change anything here. The, the, uh, the wizard has written the code for us and, and taken care of things. Um, we're, we're really good to go at this point. And we can, as developers, can focus on writing XSJS code. Um, now, one thing that we want to do is because we do have our security and things set up, uh, we need to do some alterations to the MTA YAML file as well. Uh, let me do go ahead and save this. And uh, one of the things that we want to do is we attached our security to the web module. And this is uh, standard procedure. We want our web module, our application router, to process all the security tokens and security information, and then it injects it into the inner runtimes, our, our pure node, our Java, our XSJS. That way, uh, we don't have to write security code in each of the individual modules. It'll all be handled by the, the web module for us. Um, that also means that we can hide the fact that these different microservices will actually run on different ports or URLs, and we kind of trick the, the browser, the client side, into not seeing those different URLs or ports and, and avoid any cores or cross-origin scripting problems because all of our requests will go through this web module. But in order for this to work, what we have to do is we have to come into the web module and we have to add this as a requirement, our, our XSJS module. So we're going to come here and we're going to add a new requires and we're going to tell it, yes, we want to require... The, um, not the module itself, but the, the module when we created it, it created a provider as well. Basically like an API layer. Just like it says here, it named it, it took the name of our module and just added underscore API onto the end of it. That's what we want to connect up our web module to. And then uh, we have to add a group configuration here, and the group is destinations. So it basically tells it how to route internally from the web module to our XSJS module. And we'll add some properties to that uh, to that routing. So we want to give it a name, and we'll go ahead and give it the same name as the API itself, xsjs underscore API. And I got to give it a URL. Well, we don't want to hard code a URL, so we will use the built-in variable URL. Uh, that's what the squiggly, uh, the tilde, and then the squiggly brackets means that we're wanting to access a built-in variable, so it'll be filled dynamically at deploy time with the whatever the URL that is generated for the XSJS module. And then we tell it that we want to forward auth token. And we want that true. So we want the security token to be generated by the web module, and then it will be forwarded into XSJS so we can do security checks, authorization checks, and, and see the user ID and, and things like that. So to get all of that security information without us having to write any code, it would just be there in the uh, available for us to check. So let's go ahead and save that. 
The next thing we want to do is we want to go to the XSJS module and we need to add some stuff to it as well. Um, by default, it doesn't have any security attached to it and it isn't connected to a HANA database module. The wizard is only really smart enough to generate the XSJS module. You have to kind of wire it up to, to everything else. Uh, so what we want to come and do here is we want to add require statements. And the first thing we want to do is we do want to connect it to the HDI container. That was the first one in the drop down list and that's good, that's the one we want. And then we want to connect it also to our UAA resource. And then finally, we connected it to the database container resource, but we also want to make it required upon the database module. And what that does is the requirements obviously sets up the binding so that we can access uh, these resources at runtime. That's how in that code that we just looked at, we were able to load the connectivity to the HANA database and the security um, from, from this resource, but it also sets up dependencies. So what we're saying here is it requires the DB module. So at deploy time, when the entire application deploys, the deployer knows that it has to completely deploy successfully the, the DB module before it can move on to deploying this XSJS module. So it just sets up the order, because obviously if the DB module isn't there, this resource won't exist, and, and then if this uh, service tries to start up, it's gonna error out. So, so we're, setting the, we're also setting the order uh, at deploy time that we want these objects to be created. Okay, we can switch over to the code editor just to double check ourselves here. I'm pretty sure I, I, I did it right there. We got our XSJS. We can see the wizard generated the provide statement for us. We added these requires, and then we can come up to here to our web module. We added the requirements of the XSJS API, and yeah, that all looks good. Now, the other part of this to make it work is we obviously need to extend the web module and the XS app JSON, we need to add routes. Routes tells the um, web module, when you get a request that comes in with a certain URL and path to internally on the server to redirect that request so it's processed by one of the other services in your project. So we want the web module to be able to serve out web pages if, if the requests come in, but if a request comes in for our RESTful services that are part of our XSJS code, we want it to redirect on the server to that other module. And we wired up the API so it knows about it, but we need to tell it what the rules are, you know, which which URLs, which paths, which file extensions that we want to look for and, and redirect. So uh, I've set up a, um, a template here for this. So this is... Um, Three. So we can just cut and paste this whole thing. What we are essentially doing is adding two routes. And you write your, your route rules here as regular expressions. And what we did is we basically said any URL that ends in .xsjs will then redirect that to the xsjs API. And any URL that ends in xso data, do the same thing. Redirect that to the xsjs API. And for both, apply uh, security, apply authentication from the XS UAA service. So we've set up that, that, that they will be authenticated as well and we'll pass that security information in, but we're just setting up the rules here of how to, when the request comes into the web module, which ones to re, uh, redirect internally to the XS JS module. All right, we'll save that. Now, the other thing we want to do here, let's go back to the XSJS module and what was generated by the wizard. In addition to the server JS where it wrote this code, it also had to do some configuration to tell it uh, about this XSJS module. And that's all done here in the package JSON file. So if you look at this package JSON, this is part of the power of Node.js. It's really easy to pull in external libraries. They, they're called modules in, in Node.js. And these modules could actually be out on the internet. Um, we package in um, some of the most common modules and all the SAP provided modules in with the HANA server so that if your HANA server does not have access to the internet, it still works. We can still get these XSJS and, and XS environment modules. But if you do have access to the internet and you connect your HANA system up, you configure it to be connected, 
then you can always go out and fetch newer versions even without having to do a HANA or WebID update. And in a future video, when we get to talk more about custom Node.js applications, I'll talk to you more and, and show you how we do that connection to the external site, how we can pull down other modules, where we can go to see the documentation, all that. But for now, let's, let's keep it simple. Let's keep to the context of, of backwards compatibility and just know that um, we can target particular versions here. And, and actually, we want to do this. The wizard generated version 3.3.7 we want to use a newer version here. I'm going to, I'm going to update this to 3.7.0. And this is one of the nice features of developing in this environment. Per application, we can target different versions of the runtime, of the Node.js runtime. You can see here we're targeting Node version 8 uh, and a particular version of XSJS. And, you know, in XS Classic, we didn't have that. You updated the HANA database itself, and that was the only way to update the application server and get new functionality. Now we can we can target particular versions, or maybe I wasn't ready to, to take on the latest version. I could drop this down to an older version, and, and it will still work. And when I deploy this code, it's going to copy all the, the, the engine, the Node.js engine itself, and uh, these libraries, these modules, into the deployed state, and, and then it's it's stable. You know, once I've tested it and deployed it in production, it continues to run with those versions that I specify here. Even if I do an upgrade to HANA, it doesn't automatically change my already deployed applications. So I get better stability over time. I get to choose when I want to upgrade individual applications. But on the other hand, it does mean when, when you do want to introduce new functionality, you have to go into each application and update the target version and rebuild it and, and re test it, of course, and then redeploy it. Uh, so there's pros and cons to, to each approach, of course. Um, so we've seen a bit of how we've set up the environment. This is a one-time thing. You know, I would do this with my project, and then I really don't have to mess around with the MTA YAML or the package JSON or the server JS anymore. Uh, I'm ready to just basically come here to this live folder and now I can just start creating XSJS and XSO data files just like I would have in the XS Classic environment. Uh, and in fact, let's come here and let's start by creating uh, a new XSO data. So I'm just going to say new file. And I want to put it in a subfolder called XSO data. And I'm going to name this purchase order XSO data. And notice when you create a new file, if you just put the folder forward slash it to create the folder at the same time that it's creating the file that's a that's a pretty neat little trick there um, now I want to come back here yeah I want to come back here and grab the source code you don't want to watch me type it that's what I was just checking on there let's grab the source code and we'll talk about what it does first of all ignore the error marker that you see here Similar to what we talked about in the SQL script editor in uh, previous couple of videos, you cannot trust the client side syntax errors. Uh, they throw bogus errors. There's actually nothing wrong with this code. And it's just that the client side parser is, um, is not very smart and it has not been updated. Yes, we, we know that. It's not nice. I've had an open ticket on it for a while, and we have a backlog item to fix that. It's just a low priority item because it doesn't actually uh, stop anything. Uh, so, uh, you know, once again, when you actually run this, the errors that you would get from running, those are the only ones that you really trust. Don't don't trust any of these uh, error markers that you see here. Um, but what we're able to do, this is a very simple example. We're able to take existing tables, our purchase order header and our purchase order item table, and we just drop them in here. And we're going to get OData services that expose the data from both the header and the item table. And even has, uh, you see, we reuse the concept of associations here. We used it within CDS earlier to define the relationship between two objects, like header and item, the join criteria, essentially. It does the same thing here at the OData level um, and allows us to navigate from the header or the item or include item details when we fetch the header. So uh, we'll come back to OData in a, in a later exercise and we'll see more power of, of OData. For this video, we just want to start with the basics. We want to show you sort of the mechanics, get you going here, and then, then we can touch on um, 
the specific language features and go in more depth in, in subsequent videos. Uh, but I want to do the same thing here. Let's create an XSJS service as well real quick. So let's put this in a folder called XSJS, and then I'll call it HDB XSJS. Same thing here. Let's go grab the source code, and then we'll talk about it. So if you've never done XSJS code before in the old environment, um, it's pretty simple. We get a connection to the database. Notice we don't have to supply a connection string, a schema, a username, a password. All of that is retrieved automatically from the database container binding. And when we set that in our MTA YAML, we told it that uh, our XSJS connects to this HDI container resource. That's what's going to do this automatically. That's what how it knows which uh, user to connect with and what schema to go to, what container to go into. So everything's going to be relative to that container. Um, I'm not going to have to set up connection string technical parameters or anything like that. I can just start writing SQL. In this case, I'm going to do a select from um, this view, this uh, purchase order item view. Uh, I tell it which columns I want to retrieve. I execute the query that brings back this record set object, which is basically JSON, uh, a, a JSON representation of the data. And then we're just going to turn that into a string and set it back into the response object. So we have these dollar sign APIs. That's, that's really the part of this that is XSJS as opposed to standard JavaScript. Um, they're the APIs, for instance, for interacting with the database and for interacting with the request and the response object. So the incoming re uh, request from the browser and the response back to the browser. So this is how we put data back out into the screen. We just write it into the response body. We tell it the content type that I tell the browser how to display it. And then we set the status of OK. And then the data is going to display in the web browser. OK. Uh, just to show you a couple of the other basic features, let's create a few other examples here. Let's call this one exercisesmaster.xsjs. And I'll go grab the code for this one. All right, this code shows us how we can interact with the session information. Basically, there's a dollar sign session. And what the runtime has done is it's parsed all that security token information that's coming in from the UAA and it's placed it here in the session so we can get the username and the logon language if it's being set by the browser. Uh, and then what we want to do here is just to prove that it works, we're going to put it back out into the body so we can see it uh, in our web browser. Let's create another file here called csrf.xsjs. And we're actually not going to put anything in this. This is called just a dummy service that has no logic, but it's one that we can call when we want to generate a CSRF token. And this has to do with um, uh, a, a special type of security token to make sure that all the requests are coming uh, from the same browser window uh, and that we aren't uh, like click jacking and, and, and taking over and reusing authentication that might be still cached in the browser. Uh, it is a security mechanism that we'll see how to utilize later when we get to the, the client side and we start creating SAP UI5. But we'll just go ahead and, and create this dummy service that doesn't do anything, doesn't return anything. And when we make a call to it, we can attach a request to also get this token uh, for the client side. Uh, so we're just sort of setting up something that we'll we'll see how to use later. But for now, let's just create that, that empty file, um, knowing that we'll need it later. Let's create another one here, procedures.xsjs. So let's see how we can call stored procedures as well. A uh, little bit more syntax involved in calling a stored procedure as opposed to a regular database query. Um, because uh, we use a slightly different API, so we can use the call procedure statement. Um, but the other thing we see here is in, in this particular example, we're also um, going to get some input from the client side. We've got some uh, uh, 
uh, variable commands that we can pass in on the URL that can give us branching logic inside of our service. So a little more sophisticated. Uh, but essentially, we're going to go ahead and get a connection to the database like we did in HTTP XSJS. But now instead of sending a query in, we use this load procedure command. We tell it what stored procedure, and then it creates like a proxy JavaScript function. And when we want to call the procedure, we just call that function. We pass input parameters into it like we would any normal JavaScript function. They'll be parsed and, and forwarded on to the stored procedure. And this result is going to take any of the output uh, table parameters and scalar parameters and, and build them into a single JSON object. That's what's in this results. And our particular application will just take this results and uh, stringify it and put it out in the web browser so we can, we can see it once again. So just little test applications. Probably normally you would, uh, I mean, this isn't that unusual to take the results of a query and put it out in the body as JSON. That's pretty easy to process on the client side. But as you'll see in a minute when we test this, it's also easy for uh, a person to be able to read. Uh, it's easy to test. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice way to do some coding here. Let's create another service, os.xsjs. Uh, this is one of the new features that we have in the XSJS environment. So not only did we port over existing XSJS capabilities, but we actually added a, some new APIs when we brought them into this environment. And uh, one of them is this dollar sign require. It allows us to call pure Node.js modules from within XSJS. So we can reuse open source modules and built-in modules. In this case, this OS module, this is a built-in Node.js module that gives us access to the underlying operating system information. So we can get host name, platform, uh, you know, CPU loads, memory loads, all kinds of interesting technical information. Uh, so this is something that we were never able to do in the XS Classic environment. It was always so sandboxed off that you couldn't access the file system or the OS or anything like that. Now, because we're running inside of Node.js, we have more access. Um, we have more technical libraries that we can get to, and those in turn can give us access to, to much more uh, powerful capabilities. Next, let's create another service here. Who am I dot xsjs. Uh, so I told you earlier that uh, the web module is going to process the security token. And uh, when it does, it injects that security token into the running XSJS uh, service, which in turn takes the security information and injects it into the database when it connects to the database. So even from the database level, we can see both the technical user of the container, that would be our current user. But if we select from the session context, we can see the external application user our XSA user, which might not even exist in the database, might not be a user in the database, but we can still see it and we can still do security based upon that external user, even if it isn't a database user. And this is one of the powerful aspects of moving to XS Advanced is we don't have to set up all of our users as database users, but we can still do security on them even if they aren't database users. So we just set up this little, um, little query here to, to show us that we can uh, see and access both the user types uh, from the database level and from the application server level. We're going to do the same thing here with uh, session get username. Uh, we're going to be able to see that information as well. So let's, uh, let's save all of our open files. Yep, I, I have them all saved. And now let's run the XSJS module. So I'll click here and you don't build it because if I would do a build, uh, it would go through an operation where it collects all the modules. It goes out uh, to NPN, it builds the runtime, but it doesn't actually deploy it onto the server. Uh, so it's different than doing a build of a database module. It would just sort of like prepare it. Most of the time we don't do a build. We just go ahead and do a run and the run operation will perform a build, it will still go out and fetch all the, uh, all the modules, all the libraries, all the supporting runtimes for us, but then it will go ahead and deploy it to the application server and uh, give it a URL or port and make it accessible to run. Now I'll say up front, this is going to take a little while. Um, this is perfectly normal 
on the first run that this will take, um, depending upon the speed of the file system of your server, this can take a minute or two. Because as it turns out, we're actually deploying and copying tens of thousands of files around on the file system. Um, because as I said, we take a private copy of the entire essentially application server, our Node.js application server, all the supporting libraries, all those packages that are referenced, all the packages that they are in turn dependent upon, they all get sucked down out of the internet or the local cache uh, where those packages are stored, copied physically into uh, a directory just for this application, uh, and then started up. Uh, so there's a whole lot of load that's, that's going on in the system the first time that you deploy this application or if you change the, uh, like if I go in and I would change the package JSON and, and, and give it a different version, then yes, it has to go through the whole build process again. So in, in subsequent videos, when I do the first big long run, I'll, I'll trim the video down so you don't have to watch it. But I want to give you a sense in this first video of, of how long it takes so that you have a, a, a realistic view and you're not concerned when it does take a minute or two on your on your own system. Um, and I timed my talk perfectly there. I talked long enough that it came back. I actually have a, I'm, I'm running on my laptop, but I have a pretty fast hard drive. And even though I'm in a VM, um, you know, that that was pretty fast. Don't, don't be concerned if on your a development system that it takes longer, a minute or, or two longer than what it did even on, on my system. Um, so it is fully started. And it is running. If I were to click on this URL that would take me directly to the XSJS service, I get unauthorized. That's exactly what it should do. Okay. If I try to access the XSJS service directly, I have bypassed the application router, the web module, and it's the application router that's doing the security token processing. So if I try to go directly to the XSJS service or any Node.js or Java service, I'm not going to have the security token, and therefore I'm always going to be unauthorized. It doesn't know who I am. It didn't call to the UAA and verify me. So that's that's perfectly normal. If you accidentally click test now and try uh, try to test this, that's exactly what should happen. We have to run this via the web module. We always test our Node and our Java services indirectly by going through the web module and letting that routing take place. And that way we'll get our security token processing and it'll get properly injected into the running module. Now, I actually have to restart this web module. You know, it is running here from when we started it in one of the earliest exercises. But I'm going to have to go ahead and restart this module because we made a lot of changes to it. We, we changed the XS app JSON. We changed the, the requires, the, the bindings to the service. So because I made such drastic changes, it's going to have to do a complete redeployment of, of this service. Uh, so we'll give that a minute to run here and restart. There we are. And now that that is restarted, you can see it went ahead and launched a new browser tab for us to test. Um, but what we want to do is, is I'll go ahead and uh, log in here. And of course, it's going to default to our little hello world page. But what I want to do now is I want to manually change the URL. And I just want to go to, instead of index HTML, I want to go to index XSJS. Okay. And notice now, it's not the hello world that came from our, our SAP UI5 application. It's this hello world that the wizard generated here in the root of our XSJS and our lib folder. It's this index XSJS. And all it's doing is just piping out a hard-coded hello world. And this worked because of our routing rules. Remember, in our web module, we had our XS app JSON, and we said anything that ends in .xsjs redirect it to our XSJS API. And that's exactly what it did. And our XSJS API looks at that URL and it goes, oh, index XSJS was well, starts relative to the lib folder. And that's the default configuration that it will look inside the lib folder. And then it looked for something that was named index XSJS. And there we are. Now, one thing I want to do while we're in here with this X index XSJS is I want to change this. Let's come here to hello world. UPD. 
And this is one of the nice things about the environment. It took a while to do the initial run, right? But if I change just my coding, inside an XSJS, a Node.js, a Java, uh, an XSO data. I can click run here again, and what it should do is it should just do a delta run. Yeah, you see that came back like in one second because it takes the already running service and it doesn't have to redeploy Node.js and rerun all the packages and, and uh, modules. It just injects the change to this one file into the already running service. And now I can come over here to the web page and just hit refresh and you're going to see the new result. Okay? So although the initial deploy may be may take an irritatingly long time, uh, it's for good reason as we've talked about, you know, the isolation, the um, the stability of the application. Uh, but we've tried to soften the blow of that by doing this delta injection on subsequent runs. So I think that's a that's a pretty nice feature of the of the web ID that makes that possible. Now let's look at some of our other services that we coded in this example. Let's come here to our HDB XSJS where we did this select and then we're going to return the results uh, to the web browser. So we'll just change the URL to we'll put the folder in there XSJS HDB XSJS. So basically your URL path just becomes the folder structure that we see under lib and the file names. Very simple translation. We'll hit enter and there we are. We see the JSON representation of the data. Basically this is what JSON looks like. This is a each one of these uh, inside the brackets is a record and then inside each record uh, name value pair. So the name of the column and then the individual value repeated in each record. Um, JSON is very easy to process with JavaScript and many other languages, but it, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So this is sort of the equivalent of, uh, once again, to draw a correlation to ABAP, like an ABAP internal table, but in JavaScript. And we can use the same JSON objects in the, on the server side in our XSJS and our Node.js processing, but also on the client side. Uh, we'll see later in our SAP UI5 processing, we'll, we'll use the same sort of JSON um, objects. Next, let's look at the exercises master. This is where we're going to return the session username and language. So let's uh, exercises master.xsjs. Uh, I spell that wrong. Exercise. Oh, uh, and it's expecting a command to tell it what to do. Uh, this is pretty common in RESTful services that you add extra URL parameters to tell a single service like different operations that you might want to do. So we'll go ahead and add that on the end. And there we see our application user ID, not our database user ID, but our application user ID, and then our logon language, mine's English US, coming from the web browser. But we have access to that on the server side. That's all being processed uh, along with that uh, uh, the security token. Now let's look at this operating system example, os.xsjs. Remember, this is the one that was using the, um, uh, the OS module from Node.js to give us low-level information. Here we see it running. We basically just took all the information that returns, like the free memory, the CPU load, the operating system version, uh, the host name. We pull that out and put it in JSON and return it to the client side here. Next, let's look at our example where we're calling a stored procedure. So here we are, procedures.xsjs. Uh, here we call a stored procedure. We had one table output that's being returned, uh, and we see the, uh, the JSON representation of that. Let's uh, next look at the whoami.xsjs. Remember, this was the example where we're going to select current user from dummy. That's going to give us our database user ID. Then we're going to select session context application user. So within the database, but we'll be able to see our application user, our workshop 00, even though that doesn't necessarily exist as a database user, we can still see it. And that's exactly the output that we're seeing here. Our From the XS session user layer, we, we already saw that, but more interesting from the database layer, Here's our technical user ID that was generated when we created the container. 
and it's automatically used. That's that's who the database sees as the current user. That's who ex is executing the SQL. But within the database, we do have visibility to our application user because we're injecting it from the security token uh, in the UAA into the application router, our web module, and it in turn forwards it to our Node.js module. And the Node.js module in turn injects it into the database session context. We didn't write any code to do that. Basically the bootstrap code, the XSJS module, the configuration that we did in the MTA YAML, that's what makes all of this uh, security forwarding possible and allows us to still do security in, within the database against our application user, even if it doesn't exist as a database user. And I think that's a pretty cool, powerful capability. Next, let's test our OData service. So let's just change the URL to our XS OData purchase order xso data and uh, one thing you'll see here is if i just run the service it's going to tell me format application xml not supported that's expected um, xso data version 2 originally it it's default for output format is xml but as it turns out xml is rarely used um, even outside the HANA space, when it comes to OData services, you know, it was the default of the specification because of its verbose nature, uh, the additional overhead of XML, the additional parsing overhead. It's very rarely used, and almost everyone uses JSON. Now, when we move to OData v4, the standard actually switches the default from XML to JSON to match up with the actual usage. Um, but, but unfortunately, v2 still expects the default to be XML, but when we moved XSO data from XS Classic to XS Advanced, we didn't even implement the XML version because nobody was basically using it. So why go through all that trouble to implement it? We only implemented JSON, but that does mean that you have to make sure that uh, your URL tells it that we want format JSON. And then all the subsequent requests will, will work normally. Uh, so we see here we have the header and we have the item table. Uh, if we want to see the metadata, this is one of the really nice things about OData is it's got introspection uh, to show you the, uh, the metadata about the service. So we can come here and say purchase order dot XSO data. Oh, I already have that on there on my URL. I don't need all this extra typing. And then I can just say metadata and uh, we'll come back here, my browser. There we are. I have a little plugin in my browser uh, to uh, more nicely format JSON and XML. And sometimes just that client side plugin doesn't load the first time and I have to hit refresh. But that's it's worth it, though, because it does a, a nice formatting. Uh, so if you wonder why, if you test this on your system and yours maybe is just all black and white and doesn't have the nice uh, syntax coloring, that's actually a browser plugin in Chrome that that I put on my my uh, desktop that, that does that nice formatting. Um, but what you see here is it introspects the service and tells us all the columns and data types and lengths. Um, really powerful feature of OData that it can do that. That means we can dynamically build UIs on the client side that matches up to the structure of the service without having to predefine everything. Also very powerful for aspect of XSO data because we didn't do anything to predefine this. We didn't define this. It's just reading the database and looking at the structure of the objects in the database and, and doing all this dynamically. And of course here we can query the data as well. So I'll come here and I'll give it the name of the entity, PO header, and I do need to say format equals JSON again, and it's gonna bring the data back. We have our two records, and it's just basically return the, our two records in, once again, JSON format, very easy to process on the client side. Uh, but we could also load the purchase order items. We could expand them in place. For, I'll just add a URL parameter here. Dollar sign expand equals PO equals PO item. And this is one of the powers of OData. In fact, it's it's just uses HTTP URLs as its API interface. It doesn't need a special client. It doesn't need a special library to be able to interact. Basically, if you can type it into a web browser, that's that's the API. Um, so the HTTP verb tells it what type of action to perform. We use these various URL parameters that are not defined by SAP, but the OData standards committee. 
and that gives us great interoperability with other languages, makes it easy to consume these on the client side where we don't have maybe as rich a pro uh, programming environment as what we ha would have on the server side, um, but but gives us this just really powerful capabilities with a very lightweight, uh, uh, very lightweight interface. Now, the last thing I want to show you is what happens if you want to debug this. You know, we, we didn't do anything on, we didn't write any code on the server side to create this OData service. We just told it the tables that we wanted created. And on the client side, we're just using a URL. We don't give it a, a specific um, SQL statement to execute, but maybe we want to see the, the SQL statement. And here's where we can add another URL parameter. Now, this one isn't part of the standard. This is an SAP-specific one. Um, but we're going to add SAP-DS-Debug equals HTML. And what it's going to do is instead of running the, uh, the service query and returning the results, it's going to return all this debug information. And what we can see here is we can see the request and the response object. We can see the headers, the raw data. But probably more interesting, uh, we can see the breakdown of the runtime and, and processing flow on the server. But we can also, this is the one that I use a lot of times, is we can see the SQL statement that was generated on the fly by the, by the OData service. So sometimes when we're doing troubleshooting, performance troubleshooting, maybe we need to see the SQL statement. Uh, we can then cut and paste the SQL statement into the SQL console, and re-execute the query, and maybe do a performance analysis on it. So there's all kinds of troubleshooting capabilities that you can get into once you can get to this, this raw debugging information. So that's giving you an overview of XSGS and, and XSO data and a little bit about how it's all implemented in this new WebIDE XS Advanced environment.